It's amazing that explaining life's immense diversity All comes down to some genetics and some biochemistry And life on earth is just one family And what's true for you is true for all biology Hello, welcome to Genetic Shambles Live, uh, which we've been doing regularly now for the last pretty much must be about 18 weeks. because I think this is uh, show nine and uh, we're presenting it in association with Genetic Society and the Milner Centre for Evolution at the University of Bath. Uh, I'm Robin Ince. Uh, we've been we've done, as I said, lots of different episodes about many different themes, as well as a couple that we did specifically on COVID-19. In fact, the one we did two weeks ago was trying to answer a lot of different questions people have about COVID-19, some of them dealing with some of the kind of more conspiratorial theories uh, that are out there but also looking at things like long covid etc and the news today of course there is uh, more and more information evidence and understanding of that uh, building up this is one of the fascinating things that time is of course things are changing all of the time that is the nature of science in these kind of to the nature of discovery very often um and uh, i'll tell you a few things also you can you can hear all of those old episodes and you can also watch all of those episodes they're all up there on cosmic shambles.com and i also think also at the uh, genetics unzipped uh, somewhere there and genetics unzipped podcast you can find them there uh to, tonight if you have any particular questions uh send them to us you can either tweet at cosmic shambles or you can just go into the live chat and uh it will be a very interesting one today as well because by uh one might say synchronicity if you're a Jungian, one might might say coincidence otherwise but uh it does turn up that of course uh, today for the nobel prize uh, for chemistry uh was won by emmanuel charpentier and uh also by jennifer doudner and that was for their work on crispr so it's what we're going to be talking about today which is about the editing of genes and uh, our changing understanding of that and the possibilities that that actually gives us and uh, i'll also mention one more thing one quick plug which is uh, our nine lessons of carols for curious people that we do every year for uh, normal a, a week or so uh, in London is obviously cancelled because there's just not that many things going on in terms of in the live theatre world and it's all very precarious so as opposed to just cancel it altogether now on the 12th of December this year we are going to do starting at midday a 24 hour nine lessons and carols for curious people we've announced a few people uh, already going to be doing it Brian Cox is going to do it Chris Hadfield is going to be doing it Sophie Ellis Bexter is going to be doing it we've got loads of other people it's going to be 24 hours and uh, you're going to be able to watch watch it live uh and uh, you can go go onto our website find out more about it as well because we're using it to raise money uh for charity and uh, maybe a little bit for us as well we'll just see how that goes anyway today we are joined by professor alison bentley she, she leads, leads the national, national institute of agricultural biology uh their genetics and breeding department that's in the uh cambridge crop, crop research uh department we also have dr tony we nolan, who, dr. Is tony nolan who is at uh, the liverpool school of tropical medicine and he's worked Working with Target Malaria. He's also an honorary senior lecturer at Imperial College London. Um, and uh, I will also will be putting links after the show that you can see some of their work as well, so introductions to give you um, some sense of some of the other things they do. So uh, we're going to be talking about new technologies uh, because this is an incredible thing. As you've in the previous episode, you know, the 21st century is an, an incredible incredible revolutionary time for the understanding of uh, the code within us within all living things if you uh, heard the interview i did a while ago with paul nurse that was a fantastic thing our understanding of yeast and thus our understanding of all living things that connection is an incredible thing um so it is going to be about new genetic technologies how we're going to use them to uh help ourselves i suppose really and we will start off by uh well first First of all, Alison, I'll ask you in terms of the reaction for uh, today's Nobel Prize for chemistry. Did, did Were you expecting that this, this might be uh, the year for CRISPR? Yeah, I mean, I think it's been on the cards for a while. You know, it is this revolutionary technology and, it, and it's just a matter of time until we realise, you know, I think the technology is very mature. I think the, the potential application of that is so exciting that this is really kind of a, a major 
a major time point for us to say, you know, the technology works, we have it there, and now the challenge is to really deploy it. And I think from my perspective, working in agriculture, you know, this is the price for chemistry, has great applications in, in medicine and um, disease, but it also has the potential to revolutionize the agricultural sector. And I think that's where it's really exciting for us. And, and things that, that these technologies that target the genetic makeup of organisms are really applicable across species. And I think that to me is, is really exciting. Um, yeah, so really exciting times. And, and I think, a really good time for it to be recognized as a technology and an innovation. Um, and I think it, it kind of sounds the challenge on how are we going to use this to, to better, our, better our crop production? How are we going to use this to better our lives? Well, this is, uh, CRISP is one of those things, certain words that suddenly just pop up you know out of nowhere and then you go this is the seventh time i've heard this day you know i can't remember how many years ago it was that i really noticed it was in in the public space in terms of not just within the world of you know research you work in tony i'm going to ask you for so that people first of all know what crispr is i know it uh clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats right that's what the mm -hmm. that's the translation i was given now bit by bit tell us what that all means means Okay, well, I'll first say I was surprised today, sorry, just to go back to your original question to Alison, because it's been on the cards for a, a long time. It's known that this is a worthy invention that's worthy of a Nobel Prize, but I think that people were worried that there were so many arguments going on in the background about who was inventing it, who was responsible, that it would be a long time before a Nobel was decided. But I'm glad it has been, because it is worthy of it. And the two, well, the two recipients of it were, were worthy of it for, for developing it as a genome editing tool. Now, the, in fact, just while we are on about some of the not exactly criticisms but questions that have come up I, I noticed there were a couple of articles i read this afternoon uh which said that they were slightly surprised they, they were a little bit worried that it shouldn't have got the nobel prize for chemistry it should have got the nobel prize uh for for medicine i wondered what what your reaction is to to those kind of comments um why did it get the nobel prize for chemistry well you know crispr has at its heart uh two components uh, a protein component and, a, and an RNA component. And that RNA and the way it interacts with other RNAs and the DNA um, is very intricate and took a lot of um, study to resolve. So I think it could have easily fit both within chemistry and, and medicine, to be honest. And so can you now... Um... I mean, yes, this, your again, we talk, question. Yeah. yeah, no, no, that's fine. This is what we, we always like. We much prefer to go tangential than specific. But that is and DNA, and obviously we've talked about this on uh, on here before. But it would be nice again to break these things down for for people tonight to get that sense of of what that means when when it comes to CRISPR and and yeah, what it's exactly one way that CRISPR is often described is a sort of is often described immune sort of adaptive immune system for bacteria. So bacteria, although they're tiny are susceptible to infections by other viruses, which are even tinier. And also things like plasmid DNA, which are circular molecules of DNA that can get into the bacteria and be detrimental to the bacteria. And CRISPR is a, is a mechanism of taking a sort of memory, a barcode of that virus's genome or that plasmid genome and storing it in its own DNA and then producing little targeting molecules that go and recognize that plasmid DNA time it reinfects the, the bacteria. So the bacteria is primed effectively to recognize the specific sequence of the virus and, and chop it up. And so that's where this cutting mechanism is, is originally evolved, is to cut viral DNA or plasmid DNA that invades that bacteria. So and it's in, quite so, a remarkable system in a way. Well, that's what I wonder is... The bacteria can have a memory of previous invasions. When I first heard of this, I thought that was bonkers. I, I really couldn't fathom that that could be true i mean well, we, were, we were talking right at the start this feels in the 21st century the speed of trying to keep up with the technology and the possibilities because as, as we've heard before in the past year there was that moment where with a human genome here we go there's the revolution and then people went oh no hang on a minute here's the letters now we have to work out what they all mean and how we deal with. and then in every time that we do a different show talking about uh the the kind of the radical changes of being able to edit edit um uh, genetic genes then it seems that i mean for you personally the speed of change do you still find yourself surprised or do you feel the momentum is here now and this is just the rate we're going to be moving at 
me personally, me personally, I'm surprised at how quickly it's gone. Honestly, you know, from the there's been a lot of background work, and that's one of the contentious issues of the Nobel Prize. You know, how, how do you, out of all these people that have led to this ultimate discovery, how do you award it to just two people? But because the award is for the actual genome editing application, effectively, I think it's just. But the idea that people find these signatures in a, in the genome of a bacteria that have nothing to do with any other genes in the bacteria, but these genes are related to viruses, that's the first clue. So why has it got fragments of another genome inside a bacterial genome? And then people work out that this is actually producing small RNAs from this DNA. Then they work out effectively that these RNAs are somehow essential in order to combat a, a viral infection in the bacteria. And from that, then you take the mechanism that's actually being used to combat the viral DNA and you repurpose it because it can cut DNA in a very specific way. You repurpose it for your other applications, such as genome medicine. Right. I, 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 in terms of talking about viral DNA, etc., you you wouldn't people wouldn't necessarily immediately go, ah, crops. They wouldn't necessarily think this was now in, in your area of research. Can you give me some, perhaps even a, spe a specific story about how genetic technology benefits agriculture? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think for myself as a plant breeder, I'm looking for tools that I can apply to kind of use the full extent of, of the genetic information that's available. This is the bit of the of the um, kind of organism that I can use to, to make improvements. And I think to produce a wheat variety takes up to 10 years and this is all done by crossing and putting things in the field and making selections it's a very time consuming uh, process it's all based on mendelian genetics um, and i think the evolution of of tools like crispr suddenly offer this tantalizing opportunity so you can spend 10 years uh, creating a new wheat variety that will grow on farmers fields and produce uh, the wheat that goes into all of the food products we rely on or you can make these kind of very targeted manipulations and really create specific uh, end products and I think yeah that for that for me is the most exciting kind of component of these new breeding technologies is the speed at what the speed and the accuracy at which you can use them to make changes that are that are positive and allow the, the plants to grow or do something that they couldn't already do and I think a, a really good example of something that we've been trying to do is to target um, the elements of, of a wheat grain which make it allergenic to celiac uh, patients so patients with celiacs obviously can't tolerate uh, gluten components uh, and we know quite a lot about these gliadins which are the components of the gluten which are allergenic and, and so you can see you could use CRISPR uh, to target these uh, gliadin um, components, uh, knock them out, uh, and then make a wheat that is less allergenic or has zero allergenic uh, kind of reaction in celiac patients. And so these are some of the really exciting applications that you can see. You know, these are things we we know are there and we know that uh, have a kind of negative effect uh, and we want to be able to remove them. And we can use CRISPR and these gene editing technologies uh, to do that in a, in a very targeted way as well. And this is Tony. I want to obviously right at the beginning we introduced that your area of speciality is is, is malaria. So when you're you're dealing, is this right? You're you're dealing basically with the genetics of mosquitoes. Yeah. So yeah. So as Alison mentioned, CRISPR. So yeah. So as Alison mentioned, CRISPR allows you. So it's a pair of molecular scissors, effectively. I think that's a reasonable analogy that I've heard in 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 the general media, and that's pretty accurate. But the point is, it's not just scissors that cut randomly. It's scissors that are very targeted. So because you know that it's a small RNA molecule that is required to target that molecular scissor to the sequence that you want, all you have to do is change the sequence of that small RNA molecule, and it will go and target whatever sequence that you want. So for Alison, it's this, this gene in, involved in the allergenicity of wheat. In my case, it might be looking at the genome of the mosquito, because everything now is a genome that's published and sequenced. So you know the entirety of the DNA. If you look at that DNA, and you say, OK, this DNA, this section of DNA looks like a gene that's involved in interacting with a malaria parasite that the mosquito transmits, for example. And you want to know, is that really true? Is that really the function of this gene? And you can use CRISPR to target that gene and disrupt it or modify it in some way and see what the effect is then on its interaction with the parasite. And so you can extend that to any aspect of mosquito biology that is important for its role in transmitting malaria parasites. 
So that might be its general reproductive rate, what makes it, or it might be something specific on how it interacts with the parasite, because the parasite has to go through the mosquito in order to get from one human to another. And so CRISPR has opened up a whole world of different genetic questions that, that, that we can answer. And that's the same for us in mosquitoes, the same for wheat and same for, for everything really, because this system works. Although it's originally derived in a bacteria, the, the, the prize that's been given today for the Nobel Prize is basically the adaptability of that to make it work in any other system. And that's what's so, so cool about it. Speed in terms of as as you are altering uh, the the genes. I mean, because we always, I, I suppose, the first stories many of us heard uh, were not mosquitoes. They'd be Drosophila. They were fruit flies, and and the incredible speed with which you can see how you can change uh, a, a species like that. So we, when you're, you know, what are the kind of time frames we're talking about with things like this? Can I, I'll jump in and talk about wheat yeah. because I've already said that, that wheat breeding takes 10 years uh, and now in the lab we can edit in, in wheat in 36 weeks. So this is, you know, this is an amazing kind of speed of ability to manipulate the genetic information of a wheat plant. And wheat, wheat is a hexaprop, it's got, you know, a very complex genome. So this is now kind of this is technically possible to do in in 36 weeks from the point with which you kind of start the process. Um, so that kind of compared to a 10 year time frame to produce a conventional variety, it is part of why it's really exciting for application in, in crops. And what about in, in terms of we, we should talk obviously you know talk with the celiac thing, but also the environmental benefits of this as well. This is one of those areas where, of course, as you will have had thrown at you you know numerous times, terms like Franken foods and all of these different things, which as we know, human beings since civilization began have been and probably beforehand have been altering their environment. It's just that the methods involved as you to have changed, and it takes less and less time to do it. So. Can we look at some of the, the, the benefits that perhaps aren't getting highlighted when, when people are sometimes being perhaps anxious about these? Yeah, and I think that that comes under the gene editing and the genetic modification. You know, classic GM, um, that debate has been going on for a long time uh, and about understanding some of the benefits. And, and hopefully this prize today, the awarding of it, will will open up that conversation again to say, what is really the potential of this? Is it just about curing disease or is it about kind of holistic views of, of food production within sustainable parameters of environments. Uh, and we work a lot on nitrogen fertilizer, so one of these major inputs into agriculture. And this has kind of huge implications for um, it, for the environment, for emissions. You know, we're almost at the planetary boundary of, of nitrogen. And I think these tools can really help us to understand how crop plants use nitrogen and, and how we can potentially optimize um, the use of nitrogen to produce the food, because we, we obviously need to produce enough food for a growing population. So we've got this kind of this balancing balancing act of kind of saying we need the nitrogen to produce the food, but can we understand the molecular switches that a plant uses to, to assimilate that nitrogen in the most optimal way? Uh, and I think there what we work on is is the switches that a plant has within it which determine where it puts the nitrogen how it takes it up um, and really it 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 looks to us that it's very genetically tractable so that we can kind of optimize our agricultural systems by having varieties which really kind of um, make best use of available nutrients to support the, the food production uh, ambition of agriculture but that also have this reduced environmental footprint and i think that that's of growing importance of being able to to kind of co do both of those things because the obvious thing is just to say let's take all the nitrogen away because it's a you know it's a dangerous pollutant but but you know it's not that simple because we need to produce the food that we all rely on and um, so I think these are the kind of sustainability slash kind of productivity questions um, that we're starting to get a handle on and Gene editing and, and GM really allows us to understand fundamentally in a plant how genetically tractable these things are and then potentially be able to deploy them uh, in future. Tony, do you think we, you know, again, the, the fact that we're seeing more results, because there is more publicity about actual tangible changes that are going on, that there is a change in the public's attitude? 
attitude towards, uh, as I mentioned before, sometimes it seemed it was very easy to, to rile people up and, uh, you know, there was a certain level of kind of anxiety, stroke perhaps one could say uh, paranoia. But perhaps do you, do you feel that we're, we're moving on in, in, in this decade? I think we are, and I hope we are. I mean, I think it's important to see these things not as a panacea, but everything needs to be evaluated on its merits. There's no point tinkering just for the sake of tinkering, in my view, um, if you want to apply that as a product or something. But if there's a real need there, then I think people are starting to realize as they understand more about what the technologies involve and what past efforts to try and achieve the same aims have involved, such as the breeding of artificial strains or in my case, the suppression of mosquito populations in order to get a handle on malaria. You know, when you start to put it in the context of previous things that have worked, then people start to understand a bit more that, you know, maybe it's not so different, actually. Do you, do you think, in terms, do you find it best to explain to people, because when it comes to long-term implications, for instance, when you are changing uh, a potential of a population, and indeed the potential of population, both the human population, the mosquito population, things are changed there, um, of people being able to, because I think one of the initial reactions people often have is they, it's the old cane toad thing. You introduce this one, one thing and then it turns out you didn't realise that by killing something else, then you end up creating a, another problem. Do you feel that the expression of how, of the long-term understanding uh, and, and your own projections of, because I presume that must play a part in it, of trying to go, hang on a minute, if this change happens, what then are all of the other kind of possible runaway implications? Yeah, I mean, yeah, those, yeah, I mean, yeah, those are legitimate questions, by the way. You know, it's, it's, it's fine to ask those questions, and we as scientists should be and are considering those and the likely the likelihood of those outcomes occurring. Um, but to give you an example about putting it into context with previous approaches, so I work on mosquito control. Okay, and the idea eventually is to understand the genetics and turn that into new tools to control mosquito populations. That can either be the development of new insecticides or different interventions that um, lead to behavioral changes in the mosquito or spreading genetic changes that actually cause um, an effect on the population, either by modifying it and its intrinsic ability to transmit the parasite or reducing its, its numbers. And when you say reducing its numbers, that rings up concerns for people about you know, interfering in populations, as you just mentioned. But if you put that into context, you know, 20 years ago, there were a million people dying from malaria every year and three, 300 million infected. Now, over 15 to 20 years, that's been halved. So that's half a million people every year um, less dying from malaria. And the re principal reason for that is because we've reduced the vector numbers. So the vector is the, the term for the mosquito. And that's through conventional techniques like the use of bed nets and insecticides and, and the two of them together. So we know that controlling mosquito numbers works and it's been well accepted uh, in communities because of the net outcome on malaria transmission. So there is a precedent for targeting mosquitoes and reducing their populations. Now insecticides do it very well in many examples, but they're not as specific as a, a form of genetic control would be. So in, and ask, in, in terms of, again, the the changing ethics and you, you must have to spend, you know, quite a lot of time again in the last 20 years of the first 20 years of this century, the speed of having to go, right, what are the new ethics now if we're dealing with this, whether it is in terms of disease control or whether it is in terms of agricultural change? Yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of huge area like we can use these technologies in the lab and we know they work and they really help us accelerate our genetic understanding but in terms of when we think about you know how do we release these things how do we get kind of food products or you know primary products that contain um gene edits or or our gmos uh, into into communities and um, that kind of acceptance piece as well as the the ethics and potential downstream uh, of that is a big a big part. I think for me it's always been so surprising with the 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 gene editing um, and the, the opposition to GM. You know, we eat so much food produced by a mutagenesis. You know, anyone who drinks uh, whiskey or beer will have drank 
Golden Promise, which is this famous kind of barley variety, which was created from gamma rays. So we're, we're kind of perfectly happy with a product where we've taken some seed and exposed it to very high dose kind of radiation, which is something we would normally kind of associate with, wow, that's, you know, something that's super bad. Um, and that process of mutagenizing those seeds produced lots of different changes in the genome, many of which we don't know about. Um, but we're perfectly happy to drink the kind of whiskey that's made from this um, this variety, which was bred in that way. Um, and then we have gene editing, which is is a tool that gives us a very precise control about what we're doing in terms of the genetics. So we're changing a specific thing, which we think will give us, or which we can show will give us better malting performance or, or uh, some better nutritional properties. Um, and that's... Um, kind of a difficult proposition um, and I think this kind of um, focusing on the method of production um, has really has really hampered that um, yeah but it, it doesn't make sense um, in, when you look at the kind of willingness to eat something developed by a high dose gamma ray irradiation versus something developed from a very specific um, kind of genetic tool uh, used in the lab in a targeted in a targeted way. It may say a lot about the difference between whiskey, between whiskey drinkers and people who predominantly want to have some form of satsuma or whatever. There is something where whiskey, <laughs> yeah, I'll tell with it. Yeah, I'm just going to, yeah. yeah. Yeah, this sounds brilliant. I like yeah. it. So, so, I mean, that, that, that's what I find that there is. When, when you first started work in this, I think there's a, there is what could be considered to be gut instinct, a psychological uh, uh, way. And for you, as you were explaining there, have there been any particular shortcuts when you have someone who is is not kind of ideologically against it, but they have that, you know, again, that whole idea that what's natural and what isn't natural? Have you found shortcuts to kind of being able to explain to them or just say, apart from whiskey? Yeah, apart from whiskey. I mean, everyone who eats a supermarket chicken is eating a product made predominantly from GM soy, you know, even a, a you know, all of the chickens that are raised in the UK for kind of supermarket sale are, are kind of these products which have been fed on on a, a GM product. And so you'll yeah, it's it's kind of an interesting discussion because you'll have people who'll say I'll never eat a GM product, and, and then you say do you eat chicken? Yeah, of course I eat chicken. That's you know that's and it's I think it's about how much we know as well. So we have this kind of this um, you know a very positive relationship with food. We know what we want to what we choose to eat um but where you don't often kind of step backwards from that and say how hang on what what was actually what was actually uh went into producing that and uh, and is that okay you know am i do i have this um narrative going through all of my food choices or is it kind of just an ideological stance on that on the kind of thing that i can see and think i can uh, control and know about um but yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting conversation and a lot of and, and, and very polarizing. And I think as scientists, we need to understand that uh, and really find a way forward that focuses not on the technology, but the, on the outcome, on the on the positive thing for the community, like the reduction in mosquito populations, the kind of health benefits of these potential um, food crops and the ability to produce agricultural crops with less inputs. I mean, Tony, I wonder, you know, for something that the, the story you were just telling, you know, the, 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 the incredible changes, you know, half a million people. This is, I presume that GM in some of that is also an incredible educational tool beyond explaining GM itself when you actually, in terms of the communication of, of the scientific method and scientific ideas. Sorry, are you asking, is it an Sorry, opportunity you, to, to educate about GM in general? Well, well, beyond that, when you actually see the results... Of, of this particular use of the scientific method, I'm wondering if that then becomes as an educational, as a broader educational tool as well. I think so. I mean, I, I think it, I think so. I mean, I, I think it goes slightly to what I was trying to say earlier that, you know, every case has to be evaluated on its merits. And if, if people want to have a choice between a GM version of a food in the supermarket and a non-GM food in the supermarket, I think that's a legitimate choice to be allowed to have. And you, know, you can make the choice on whether whether to uh, whether you think that's a reasonable investment of the GM technology in order to achieve and have that choice. Um, in my application of, of this type of technology towards mosquito control, you know, that's a problem that is not uh, largely anymore, thankfully, 
uh, occurring in the West or in, in Europe, for example. You know, there was once upon a time significant malaria transmission in Southern Europe, even in parts of England and Cambridge and the Fens. But that's long since gone and partially because of controlling the mosquito populations. And so now the vast majority of the burden of that disease of malaria and other viral born, sorry, viral diseases that are transmitted by mosquitoes lies in developing countries where there aren't tractable ways many times to get a handle on this problem. And so you need alternative solutions. Now, this type of genetic control that I'm talking about, which I haven't actually explained that well yet probably, is not a silver bullet. It's very important that that comes across. And just as I'm sure Alison would say that, you know, GM is not a silver bullet for all our food problems, but it can help as part of a multifaceted approach that looks at all different interventions that can be made. And I think that we as scientists, or I, that's my personal opinion at least, is that it's dangerous to go around saying this is, a, this is the magic bullet here, I've got it. And most of us don't do that anymore, as much as we appreciate what advantages these technologies can bring. Can I ask you, yeah, when, when, I'd like to, when you, in, in education, when you, when, you were, when you were growing up and when you, you know, went, went through university, etc., what eventually drew you, first, first of all, you, Tony, and you know, now working in this, this, this groundbreaking area in terms of, of malaria control, can you look back and you can see the things that drew you to this particular area of innovation? Innovation. Yes, um, but it's not this lamp sort of light moment where I thought that's it for me. I was I did my undergraduate at Imperial College and um, you do a final year project there and I wanted to do something in parasitology. So I started working on the malaria parasite itself and um, then I wanted to go to Africa and see what it was like to work in the field and see what the actual situation was there. I never got to Africa. I stayed in Wellingborough, my hometown, because I was waiting for a response. There was no email in those days, and it took about four months to get a letter communication to the Gambia and back. At which point, my the person that I did my soup my project with um, asked me to come back to do a PhD, and I was all set. And I, you know, because I wanted to do a PhD in parasitology, and he said, "No, no, forget that. I've, I want you to do this. I know that you're going to be good at this," which was to transform the mosquito that transmitted the parasite to transform it genetically which hadn't been done at the time. And he thought that I had the right skill set to go at that. And that's what I did. And from then on, I've been working more with a couple of interventions consistently in that field for 20 odd years. And CRISPR has taken it on to the next level because that allows us to do um, this next step of actual genetic control, which is spreading a modification into a population. What about you in terms of how you found yourself um, in particular looking at crop research? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's always been agriculture, which probably kind of indicates a lack of, <laughs> you know, it's a, it was a very singular aim. And, and it happened in my first week of high school, we had this um, agriculture teacher, kind of a biology teacher who wanted to teach us about plants. And he gave us all a potato and said, cut this up into pieces and you're going to plant it. And we were all just like, what are we doing? Anyway, then these plants grew and we and then in this moment when we dug up the plants and these kind of components of this single potato had grown into into you know multiple potato plants and produced this amazing crop of potatoes and I remember all the boys in the class started throwing the potatoes and there's kind of a you know all this kind of um tomfoolery and I just stood there like this is amazing like I never knew you could cut up a potato into five pieces and grow like a hundred potatoes from it so it was this kind of light bulb moment I guess uh and so from then it was it was only agriculture and I think I spent all my summers on on farms working in Australia where I grew up um, on farms and really trying to understand farming systems uh, and then yeah when I finished school I went to Vietnam for six months and I think that's where I first kind of realized that this kind of effect of the transformative power of agriculture to produce food is not equally distributed um, and this kind of access to technology and access to food is is uh, very inequitable uh, and that you know a lot of a lot of effort is needed to kind of um, try and uh, address that I guess and so that's what's always kind of driven me kind of working directly on farms and with farmers to really understand how things can be translated and deliver benefits to the people and the communities who rely on them as well as kind of serving you know the populations of cities uh, and supermarkets. 
that is what I find, you know, t- from both you and looking at some of the work you did before when I was reading up on that, well. that as well. You know, that phrase you just used there, transformative power is uh yeah and and that's uh, we've got we've got our first kind of uh, questions coming in now we have one from stanley stanley would like to know this is uh for, for both of you i'll start start with you tony if we genetically modify enough wheat uh, or mosquitoes how long until those genetic traits become the standard in an overall population so tony yes yeah, starting with you okay well that's uh, okay well that's um that's a very good question and uh, it gives me a chance to actually explain what i do because you just mentioned the, the thing about transformative power. So until about 15 years ago, we had ways to add genes to the mosquito genome, but we didn't really have ways to get those into a population, to get those traits into a population. And so um, I took a break from working on mosquitoes for a while. And when I saw this project proposal that was about spreading those genetic, trans, those genetic traits into a population, I came back to it. Because what I work on is something called gene drive. And gene drive refers to the biased inheritance of a genetic element. So ordinarily, when you have one copy of a gene on a chromosome, that individual has two copies of every chromosome. So it means that there's a 50% chance of it transmitting that gene to its offspring. And what the gene drive does is prior to the making of the offspring and and the sperm or the eggs, it copies itself across from one chromosome to the other. So no matter which chromosome you get, it will have a copy of that gene. That's how a gene drive works. So what that means is you can have this trait that affects the mosquito's ability to transmit the parasite or to reproduce itself. And this gene drive, because it's selfish, copies itself across and increases in frequency in the population, even if it's affecting the mosquito's inherent ability to reproduce or transmit the parasite. And so in the best case scenario, a gene drive is doubling every generation. So to answer the viewer's question, is doubling every generation and in a a village within 10 or 12 generations it could have transformed the whole population in that village so given that a mosquito's average lifespan is about three weeks that's in the course of a year in a village you could transform it from an initial very small release um allison for you in terms of talking about about wheat yeah so wheat's an inbreeding seed so it kind of breeds true so the seed that you plant is the very much the same genetic identity as the seed that you'll get back so varieties are kind of released and regularly updated. Um, so, so I think it, it's quite a different um, situation to to with mosquitoes. Um, but yeah, obviously, if you can get genetically modified traits into varieties, you then have um, seed systems and ways to to get that seed uh, to farmers, uh, and that seed will breed true. That that raises some questions about what the stewardship of that of that material is if you're saving it for the next generation and it has a gm uh, trait within it um but yeah so so because it breeds true it's an inbreeding species and you don't get this kind of transmission of that um that gm trait into a into a wider population because it's a a, it's a seed crop that you need to harvest and sow uh, each year and we've got another specific crop question, in fact, from, from Lily, who said uh, she was very interested in what you talked about, talking about before uh, involving nitrogen. And what she was interested in knowing is, is it imaginable in the near future or indeed in any future to see a world where crops do not require fertiliser? Yeah, I mean, that's a super exciting, exciting area of research. So this this idea that you can engineer nitrogen symbiosis. So the legume crops do that, legume species do that themselves. They make associations with bacteria, which occur naturally in the soils. And then these bacteria produce nitrogen and, and essentially feed the feed the plants. So if you grow beans before your wheat, you get the nitrogen that was produced by that preceding crop. Uh, and there's a really big effort to try and transfer that into the cereals, so the the, the really widespread staple crops. Um, I mean, it's a it's a it's a really high risk, high reward type strategy because what you're essentially trying to do is to take the pathway, so this kind of pathway by which a legume plant makes these associations with the microbiome microbiomes microbes in the soil you're trying to transfer that into uh, into cereal species essentially um, and that would likely look like a gm that would be a gm approach to to do that or to at least understand all the components of that um, but if that happens i mean then you're going to get plants that can produce their own nitrogen to support them 
to support the production of, of those crop plants. So that's a really kind of exciting area of, of very active research and, and very great promise in terms of particularly developing world agriculture and the potential. But I think it's, it's you know, the scientists who work on that would say there's, there's a lot to understand uh, and there's a lot of work to do. But it is there there is a dream that that will happen at some point. Brilliant. And we've got a, a, another question. This is for you, Tony. This is from Melissa. Uh, based on what you just said, after one population is fixed, could they interbreed with other populations so you get a wider area on non-malaria mosquitoes? Or does the short lifespan make that unlikely? That unlikely? Uh, well, I think there's two questions in there. So one thing is the ability to go across species. And because this relies on mating, to get from one generation to the next and to spread itself. Speci the definition of a species really, by and large, is a population that interbreeds with itself and makes fertile offspring. So that gene drive should stay within that species in which you release it. In terms of spreading from one population to another that are geographically distant, then that can happen if there is physical connection and there is the occasional migration between two villages, for example. And so when there are different sort of power levels of gene drive, if you like, you can have one that's very invasive and you can have one that's not very invasive. And the advantage of a very invasive one is that you release a, a manageable amount of mosquitoes and then the mosquitoes do the hard work of finding the other mosquitoes and spreading that into population. The disadvantage obviously is that it's more difficult to control the rate of spread and not everyone might want it as you can imagine. So, Sorry. It can happen both ways is the answer. Another question now. We're nearly out of time, by the way. So if you've got a question, send it in now. Uh, Yaz just wanted to know, uh, I'm fascinated by CRISPR, but are there uh, imaginable or nearly imaginable new ideas in uh, genetics research which would have the possibility of being as revolutionary? So uh, I think she's basically saying that can be as broad as you want in terms of don't worry if this is not entirely harnessed to our current understanding in terms of the broadness of your imag imagination, uh, new possibilities. So Sorry, I, Anson, yeah. Yeah, I'll go. Uh, I mean, I think there's kind of next immediate next steps like you can see the innovation pipeline could just kind of building behind it and for us working in, in crops with kind of um, kind of complex genomes the ability to use CRISPR to knock things out is now kind of standard and we can do that we can stop the action of, of certain genes by by cutting with these molecular scissors and making it stop I think the next challenge for us is being able to knock things in using the CRISPR technology so at the moment you can insert with your molecular scissors you can insert a small template that kind of tells the cells machinery how to kind of um, repair the cut and you can use that to kind of insert some genetic information um, but we're really interested in pathways so these kind of very complicated genetic um, kind of cascades of information uh, and those are very long you know they're kind of long very long strands of, of DNA and, and genetic information so I think for me that's the kind of next big kind of revolution in the use of CRISPR, the ability to use it to kind of get in big things. Uh, and then it becomes much more of a tool like like GM, where you can put things in um, that didn't exist before and, and use this very elegant tool to kind of bring new things in as well as to stop them, which we know we can do, we can do now. So that for me is like the next exciting kind of innovation and, it, and it's coming coming very quickly, I think. And Tony? And Tony? Um, yeah, I should say what Alison's referring to there is very organism dependent. So in the mosquito, for us, it's very easy to put things in. So we're, and that's just by fortune of the mosquito's biology and where, where we attack it. Um, so that's not a hindrance to us. Um, I think perhaps the question was more was wider than CRISPR I wasn't quite sure if he was talking about next developments in CRISPR uh, I, 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 think, I think it was yes, looking wider. at it I, I think it was imagining what could be the next remarkable uh, uh, moment in terms of genetic research the wording and, didn't have to be too harnessed to what we actually okay. uh, know yeah well I think you know no yeah well I think you know the fact that we can sequence genomes so easily now at, at low cost is going to be transformative so it means that you know, you could, in my case, you could pick a mosquito from somewhere in Uganda and you could pick a mosquito from somewhere in Tanzania, say, and you could see if they're genetically related simply by sequencing 
their their genomes and you could see you know patterns of migration just by looking at genetic signatures that are found in different regions of Africa and that can tell you a lot about you know whether insecticide resistance is moving how interconnected populations are which matters for for our approaches for the for the reason I just gave to the previous question um, so you can get a big picture on everything that's happening just by looking at genomes and I think that's going to be transformative but in general I think that you know the basic research that understands biological mechanisms is still going to be at the heart of all this because it's very unlikely that you could conceive something that's better than what nature has already made and that, that applies for the CRISPR genome editing tool it's, it's inspired by nature it's not exactly the same as what happens in bacteria but it's been re-harnessed to cut eukaryotic genomes where it doesn't normally exist so I think that's the way to go Thank We've you. run out of time now, so thank you. I'm sorry for everyone whose questions we haven't been able to deal with. I'll just end up because it seems like a, a nice one to end on with. Uh, Flip just wants to know, uh, and you may well have in some ways answered this to some extent, I think, in the previous 45 minutes, with, with some, but uh, what have been the, or what has been the greatest revelatory moment for you, either in the lab or in the field? So uh, um, should I start? can I start with you, Alison? Is that a, I know that's a, a, a tough one. Yeah, it is a tough one. And I guess um, kind of going off, off message, really, my biggest revelation was in a field in the Punjab in northern India. Uh, and it was realizing that not all solutions are genetic. So we've been working on nitrogen, the genetic control of nitrogen response in, in crops for a long time. Um, and, and we were in the field talking to farmers and, and they were kind of explaining how it's not, they're not currently limited by the varieties they have. They're limited by um, the agricultural policies that determine the, the price of nitrogen. And that's really what informs their decisions on, on what they buy, not anything to do with the genetics. Uh, and I think that's really important as a scientist, being able to look at, at the challenge that you're trying to address and say, is genetics appropriate? You know, we're not, you know, we can do gene editing, but we, we don't have to do it just because we can do it we need to understand really what the challenges are and, and then develop the kind of appropriate research and, and kind of implementation um pathways for from that um but yeah so that was really that was really kind of a mindset change from saying that solutions are always genetic and i think if you're a plant breeder or a crop geneticist you know that's that that's the temptation um but often you know there, there's a cascade of solutions and, and some of those will be genetic but having a more more holistic uh, view of of challenges and how we can best address them using science led solutions is is really important and, and a really important lesson to learn when you're a you know, a keen kind of geneticist and research scientist. Tony, revelatory moment in the uh, the lab or the field? In the uh, the lab or the field? Yeah. Um, well, when I was a PhD student, I was trying to develop different components, and put them together to make a transgenic mosquito. But because it hadn't been done, you have these what we call marker genes, and you don't know whether they work. You don't know whether you'll be able to see them. So I'm screening all these thousands of mosquitoes as larvae under a microscope and I'm thinking maybe it's happened but I just can't see it maybe it's happened I just can't see it shall I look at these slides again look at these slides and then all of a sudden bang there was this bright green uh, mosquito larva expressing GFP amongst about 35 and it was unmistakable so I knew then that we made the first genetic transformation that's fantastic. That was, that, was, that was pretty impressive. Tony and Alison, and uh, thank you as usual to uh, uh, those that we're making this with, Genetics Society and the Milner Centre for Evolution at the University of Bath. Thank you also to our producer, uh, Trent Burton. As I said, all the uh, the previous episodes are up as well. We've done a couple on COVID-19. Uh, there's also another uh, conversation now, which is not necessarily part of Genetic Shambles, but with Paul Nurse uh, about his book, What is Life, and uh, about his career um, in genetics as well. And uh, a reminder that on the 12th December this year, we're going to do a 24 hour version of the uh, Nine Lessons of Carols for Curious People uh, with Sophie Ellis Bexter and I think Helen Sharman, as far as I'm, I hope that's been officially announced. Helen Sharman and uh, Chris Hadfield, uh, Brian Cox, and uh, and many others. Go and check the Cosmic Shambles site for that. Uh, as I said, we're going to put up, uh, there'll be some links under this as well, uh, which will tell you more about Tony's work and Alison's work. And we're going to be back in uh, two weeks' time. And I can't remember specifically what we're going to be dealing with on uh, that week, but we'll be back in two weeks' time. It will be genetic based and uh, we will be live thank you everyone who sent in questions as well and good night <laughs>